So our focus becomes on following the life demonstrated by Jesus rather than his sacrificial death. It calls us to follow his path that he walked for each of us, a path that was filled with the expression of love in all its forms, compassion, forgiveness, right judgment, generosity, kindness. This, as it was for Jesus, is our path to know God. So last Sunday, we began our series, The Universal Christ, based on the book by Father Richard Rohr. He's a Franciscan monk, and he believes that to be a Christian is as simple and as complex as our ability to see God in everything and everyone. It is both simple and complex. And one of the greatest shifts that we can make, both individually and collectively, is to rewrite the narrative that we should be worshiping Jesus to one that enlivens us to follow him. Can you imagine a world of people where everyone is striving each and every day to live a life of compassion, of non-judgment, of abundance, of forgiveness, for when we fall short. That, in my opinion, would indeed be a wonderful world. Father Rohr introduces us to a new trinity, a trinity of faith, hope, and love, a different facet of God's expression, of God's good that was infused into the creation. They can be understood as different virtues or attributes that we also carry because we have been created in that likeness and image. And he suggests that discovering and owning and living from these virtues reflects our true nature, is when we are reflecting God revealed through us. He describes faith as a trust in inner coherence, and that just means harmony or unity itself, a trust in inner coherence itself. It all means something. Hope is a trust that this coherence is positive and going somewhere good. And love is a trust that this coherence includes me and even defines me. This is in many ways a radical departure of the foundational beliefs that many of us were taught in our early church upbringing, and yet is probably a closer understanding of what God meant to the people in early Christianity. The Christian theology of today is radically different and was profoundly influenced by the premise that St. Augustine introduced in the fifth century. So this was several hundred years after Jesus had left the planet and later indoctrinated into all the various offshoots of Christianity by people like Martin Luther and John Calvin, who in my Presbyterian world was the one who shaped and formed a lot of what we know as Presbyterianism today. And this spread like wildfire, unfortunately. In simple terms, what St. Augustine introduced is the idea of original sin. This was not a concept in early Christianity. And this idea of original sin emphasized that all human beings are born into sin because Adam and Eve, those first humans, offended and disobeyed God. In this narrative, sin is not merely a reflection of bad choices that we might have made. It is something that we have inherited. It was something that was done to us, not necessarily by us. It's known in many circles as the fall. That original fall follows each of us. Now I have to tell you that 
My understanding of this when I was younger, I, I wrote here my 17 year old incredulous preacher kid self, because that's where I was coming from, had an issue with it um, when I got to be that age. I self-described the narrative to my father this way. I, it was like, so you're telling me that an all-powerful, wise, all-knowing God created these two people, gave them this perfect place to live, except they couldn't eat from this one tree. And when they did, they and every human who followed in this creation was cursed as unworthy, and as Martin Luther even described it, a pile of manure. <laughs> and even as totally depraved humans, we are punished by this very angry God when not living up to our very nature. <laughs> Things got so bad that the only solution that this all wise and knowing God could come up with was to send his son and sacrifice his life as an atonement for our sins. If you happen to hear of him, you just might be saved. If you worship him, then you'll more likely go to heaven for all eternity. And if you miss that boat, then you're going to the heat. You will be in the heat of hell for all eternity. One shot, either you get it right or you don't. I said, that's the story? No, thank you. That was my response. He said, then go find what makes sense to you. I had a very enlightened father, thank God. And I don't think he bought into the story in quite the same way. In that narrative, we all end up with a Jesus who was merciful when he walked the earth and yet punishes in the next world, who forgives when he was here on earth, but not later on. A God that is not always trustworthy and could change his mind again at any time. Jesus' death instead of his life became the narrative of what saves us. Is it any wonder that every human being, I'm gonna say at least in the West because I don't know the Eastern cultures as well, at some level has struggled with a sense of unworthiness or not being enough. It is ingrained through hundreds and thousands of years of narrative. Thankfully, Later in life, I found a Christian understanding that I could embrace when I found unity. Our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle, and other new thought leaders and thinkers like Ralph Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry Thoreau and many others that started different ways of believing and exploring this idea of God and Jesus in the rise of the age of reason came to a different premise. And that premise is original blessing. These folks did not discover something new, brand new. They were rediscovering something that had been in the minds and the hearts of the earliest Christians and that had lived in many ways hidden in the realms of monks and other Christian mystics throughout time. And I'm so grateful that it is now coming more into the light with people like Richard Rohr, people like Marcus Bach and Bishop Shelby Spong, who are bringing us a new understanding, a new way to frame the stories and the narratives that we read in the Bible and it's beginning to find its way into a more progressive Christianity. It's not just unity and other new thought churches that are reading this material. It is a wide swath of Christianity that is now beginning to have to wrestle with, at least, this idea. Original blessing is a positive and generous cosmic view of life. It is a lens that says that good is present 
even if it's not visible in this moment. In the beginning, from the beginning, God called all of its creation good. Yes, we're told that. Every aspect of creation was called good, and at the, event, at the end it was called very good. And with this as our foundational belief, our life simply becomes a matter of becoming in full consciousness who we already are. It's not about trying to become something different. It's about revealing what is already present. Our human journey is to uncover our godness. It's to uncover our goodness. And it's not just within us. It is indeed within everyone and everything. So our focus becomes on following the life demonstrated by Jesus rather than his sacrificial death. And in the coming weeks, we're going to explore a new way to understand the death of Jesus from a different perspective and understanding. It calls us to follow his path that he walked for each of us, a path that was filled with the expression of love in all its forms, compassion, forgiveness, right judgment, generosity, kindness. This, as it was for Jesus, is our path to know God. As Jesus and others who have followed him demonstrated, following this path of positi positivity is possible even in our darkest moments. Paul wrote in Philippians 4.4, 4, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. And you might think, well, that was easy for Paul to say, but at the time he wrote this, he was imprisoned and in chains. And he was still able to be in that awareness of celebrating the goodness of God. We find our original blessing, our original goodness, when we discover and trust that faith, hope, and love, our attitudes, our virtues, deeply implanted within us. They are indeed, as the author suggests, our soul's foundation. So I want to invite you this morning to take a moment here, and we're going to lead into a meditation a time for each of us to see if we can't tap into that original blessing, that original goodness from which we've been created. So I just invite you right where you are to get comfortable, close your eyes if that helps you focus inward. And begin to just focus on your breath as it flows in and out of your body for your breath is always flowing in the present moment. And it is in this moment of now that we can experience the goodness of God. So as you just continue to breathe, feeling that sense of relaxation moving through your body, Allow this thought to bubble up into your mind and to expand as you focus on it in your heart space. I have been created in the image and likeness of faith, hope, and love. See if you can truly claim that for yourself. I have been created in the image of faith, hope, and love. Affirm it to yourself one more time. I have been created in the image of faith, hope, and love.
Now see if you can embrace this thought as truth in your entire being, as my words become yours. God loves me. God loves me, all of me. I am God's beloved creation. God loves me. Just notice how that feels. Notice if your heart has grown even wider and deeper. And if there's any sense of resistance, any voice that is not in agreement, send it love. And know that this journey of claiming our original blessing continues. It's okay. Because whether we believe it or not, God loves each and every one of us. There is nothing, no action that could ever diminish that. And when you're ready, simply bring your attention back to your breath, aware of the fullness of it moving through every part of your body. And when you are ready, can open your eyes. So one of the foundations in unity is something that we call positive affirmative thinking. That as we focus our thoughts in ways that affirm life, in ways that see the good, we tend then to have that more and more as our experience. We tend to attract it instead of focusing on the negative. And it's been shown in brain science that our default, and this is probably a leftover brain function from our survival days, is to focus on the negative, is to focus on what may not be right, what may go wrong at any moment, instead of paying attention to the good that's unfolding. And anything that can draw us out of ourselves in a positive way, I want you to know, is revealing the very essence of God. It's revealing love in us, as us, and through us. So I wanted to share with you as I've been working on this, something that I've been doing, it might inspire you to perhaps have a new practice to see the good more often, to see that original blessing flowing into the world. So usually, um, at least four or five days a week, I drive here to the church office. I drive 183 to 121 North and take the same route back down to Precinct Line Road. And both directions, the lanes go down. In some cases, two lanes disappear and the other direction, at least one lane disappears. And every single day, there are cars that are in the lanes that are about to end, worming their way up till the very last minute, knowing, I think they drive it with me just about every day also, and it backs up the whole system, and we all crawl along. When I'm sitting in this, on the days that I am disconnected from my spiritual self, which does happen, I express oftentimes quite choice words. One that begins with A is my favorite. I won't say it here today, although I was worried about the kids, but you know what? Any kids who have draw, driven in a car with an adult are probably already aware of this word. Um, 
And I start to make up stories about these people, how they're self-centered, how they're, who do they think they are, how rude they are, how uncaring they are. Uh, you know, it, every day I can come up with something really creative uh, as to why these people feel like they are entitled to wait till the very last moment and then muscle themselves in. I'm a very defensive driver, so oftentimes I will leave lots of space in front of me, but no, they will drive right by that space so that they can get two cars further up in and get themselves into traffic. Now, when I am centered in my spiritual self, which does happen, even while driving, my thoughts I've noticed change. I think to myself, well, maybe they've overscheduled their life so full that shaving off a few minutes of their drive time really is that important to them. Or perhaps another thought I noticed was maybe they just feel so powerless in so many other aspects of their lives that this is the one place that they can feel powerful. And what happens when I can think those thoughts is I start to then have compassion for them. How sad, in my opinion, that they feel so powerless in so much of their lives or that they feel it's so necessary to schedule themselves so close together that they just don't have time to go with the rest of the flow of life. And when I can have compassion, it changes me. May never change their behavior, but it changes me and my experience and the way I get to experience it most days when I'm going. So that's been my practice to really try, if I'm noticing myself making up not so kind stories about the people who are um, acting in this way, I try and go, okay, let me reconnect with the place of me that has compassion. What could I imagine that would let me feel compassion for these folks? Because when we can do that, when love becomes a flow of energy, willingly allowed and exchanged without requiring payment in its return, when it is given just freely, that's when the magic happens. And we open up a space, not only for ourselves, but perhaps for those folks to feel that sense of compassion from others. So that's your invitation this week, is to practice focusing your attention on all that is good, on all that is love, on all that is faith, on all that is hope, on all that is God. And when you find that perhaps your thoughts have taken you away from that practice, to try and take that everyday moment that you're in the midst of that is irritating or frustrating or upsetting you and see it through the eyes of faith and hope and love. And what you'll experience is such a greater sense of compassion and kindness. And that is God revealed in us and through us. Blessings. Well, it is our time to give thanks for all of the abundance that flows in and through our lives and the many ways in which, as Matt so aptly put, we receive our abundance here in unity. Certainly financial is one of those ways, but we love it with the gifts of love and the ways that you support and volunteer in this church for the ways in which we continue to grow and discover and learn together. But we will take a moment as we just hold these gifts or the energy of them if we give through the Committed Given program in our hands, in our hearts, as we join and bless them together. Divine love, as me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, oh, all that I, hope I receive, and all that I am. Yes, thank you. And so as we go into this day, into this week, open-hearted, open-minded, to see God revealed in and through us, we go, knowing our prayer for protection together. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. 
The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Woohoo!